Thank you. Guys, I'm sorry I was late. I was just rocking out. That music was unbelievable. I've never heard anything like it. It was just awesome. This has been amazing. The only thing I'm more excited about than the music is this gathering. I mean, you guys are incredible, and it's an inspiration to be here. And what I want to do is so much has been said already is maybe tie together some of the themes you've been hearing in other places by telling you, if I could, two stories, and I'm going to share with you two conclusions, and then I have three reflections, and then maybe we can open up to a couple of questions at that point. First story. About eight or nine years ago, I had this wonderful opportunity to invest in a company that had a great idea. And the idea was, wouldn't it be wonderful if you had collections of people who could share ideas about how you buy and sell goods in a local community? So in other words, there are people looking to buy bicycles, there's people looking to buy cars. You can do it very locally and make it very community-oriented. This is eight years before Facebook. This is eight years before Twitter. There was no social media. The entrepreneur was, couldn't have been more exciting and more innovative in what he was trying to do. He raised a ton of money, and in the United States, he got just about every newspaper company to back this project. This thing could not fail. Within two years of the operation, it failed outright. I can't to this day tell you why this thing didn't work. I can't tell you if it was ahead of his time. I can't tell you whether the newspapers trying to protect their own classified advertising killed the thing, but I can tell you it didn't work at all. The entrepreneur was written off for dead. He had failed. He had lost tens of millions of dollars, and he had messed with a bunch of the major media companies in the United States. This entrepreneur is a man named Mark Pincus. And I don't know if you follow this in the United States, but after three years in oblivion, he started a company called Zynga. And for any of you who are interested in online communities and gaming, this is literally the biggest thing happening in the United States online today. I mean, right after Facebook and Twitter, this is one of the high valuation areas. Mark was dead. He was forgotten. It was over. And within three years, he took the learning about community, he took the learning from the mistakes that he made, and the passion he had about how people are interacting, and he built this amazing enterprise. Story two. This is one of my favorite stories. I'm not even sure if I can convey this overall. But a very, very good friend who's in the biotech business in the startup spent an absolute raise, a great amount of money, to build a drug that was literally going to save thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, of people's lives. Everything was growing great, but what he had to do is he had to get approval from the regulatory process, he and his team of maybe 20 people. Everything looked great. Doctors had everything set up. Everything was going to go well. To not make it overcomplicated, because frankly, I don't even understand most of it, but what it came down to one week before he was running out of money, he had to get approval from the FDA to go to the second round of tests, and if he went to the second round of tests, he would have an opportunity to raise literally tens of millions of dollars more and go forward. The test at a reductionist level had to come back, just bear with me on this right now, with a number that was less than three. Forget what the indication was, I'm not even sure I understand it. If it was over three, he would fail the test, and he'd have to start from scratch. If it was anything below that, he was in and the business would go. On Tuesday, before the Friday that he was going to run out of money, the report came back, and it was a 15. So he and his team got together and said, this doesn't make any sense. You know, we worked with the doctors who were doing the tests. These are great guys. We never, in our own private tests, even got into anything in the time zone of this. It's absolutely impossible. So they got in a meeting with the FDA and said, it's absolutely impossible. This could not have happened. There's a mistake somewhere in the research. And the FDA looked at them and said, I'm sorry. That's it. You're done. You have another year. You can come back and refile. There's nothing we can do. The report is the report. They failed. It was over. The company got together literally that night, 20 employees, about half of them literally had given up, done. The other half started thinking, is there a way we could still raise money from somebody, but there's no way we can do it. Could they find the doctor? And the guy at the FDA told him, says, you know, you can't get the doctor. The doctor's away fishing in Alabama. Now, I don't know how many of you have been in the United States or visited Alabama, but if you're fishing in Alabama, you're gone. There's no way to find you. Except that one entrepreneur in the company not only found out where he was in Alabama, in the town there, but what kind of fishing he liked to do. And so literally at one point he turned to his entrepreneurs and he said, I'm going to Alabama. And the team said, what do you mean you're going to Alabama? He said, I'm going to go to Alabama. This isn't right. I know it's wrong. I'm going to figure it out. Gets on an airplane within the next day. It was in southern Alabama at this one port town that had one dock. He confirmed that lo and behold the doctor was there and was out fishing in the water and he rented a motorboat. And with documents in hand, he literally sailed out looking for this doctor. He found the boat, found the doctor. To this day, I would love to have been on the doctor's boat as this little motorboat was running up with this guy waving documents all around him in every way. It's just unbelievable. 
pull them aside, and say, look, this cannot be right. The documents are not right. Can you look at these documents? And the doctor looked at him and said, it's dead wrong. It wasn't 15, it was 1.5. You guys are fine. This is a typographical error. The guy in the motorboat physically grabbed the doctor, stuck him in the motorboat, drove him back to the main port, found the one fax in town, faxed it to the FDA, got on the phone call with the doctor to confirm it was true. And this is probably my favorite line of all. After all this orchestration and everything else, the FDA guy said one thing and one thing alone. He said, oh, okay. That was it. Done. They passed. The company is a company called Metamune. Metamune ended up being a multi-hundred million dollar company that was sold to a major pharma company about a year ago for hundreds of millions of dollars. And in many respects, more importantly, if it has not saved hundreds of thousands, if not millions of lives, it has had huge impact in multiple drugs as it's done overall. It was done. It was dead. Most of the people thought it was over. Someone said, I'm going to Alabama. I have two conclusions from these stories. First and foremost, failing sucks at every level. There's a cliche in America, which I think is actually true, like many cliches, that it's okay to fail. It becomes something that's pretty pos possible that you can go through overall. And I think it's true, but it doesn't take away one iota from the reality that it stinks. I have a very dear friend who's an investor in France and who speaks very beautifully with a beautiful accent. And he said to me once, he said, you know, Chris, the thing that's so wonderful about America is that for you, failure is scar tissue. And that is a wonderful thing because it makes you stronger. To which my reaction was, John Claude, scar tissue is great, but surgery stinks. Tearing your hair, hamstring stinks. It stinks to do it. It's a reality. And nobody loves it. But his fundamental point was true, because the reflection, too, failure is redeemable. It is always redeemable. Three reflections on this. A lot of people disagree with me on this. People think that cultures value failure differently. They absolutely do. People argue with me that failure is about externalities. You can't have to be judged if you make a mistake. Your financiers will never back you again. There's real risk involved. But I actually believe that failure is mostly in the mind. Failure is within us. There's a wonderful quote from one of my favorite TV shows in the States that says, look, you can be what you want to be, or you can be what you're expected to be. You can be what you want to be, or you can be what you're expected to be. And that means at the end of the day, you take failure for what it is, and you move on. I think the only rudder in entrepreneurship, and I think 100 people have said it 100 different ways here overall, is what do you love? Or what problem do you want to solve because you love solving that problem? A dear friend of mine and a wonderful guy in Silicon Valley is a man named Mark Andreessen. He is a unique and remarkable intellect, and I have never known anyone to gather information the way he does. It's an amazing thing to watch in all focus, not just technology. He literally reads 300 books a year. He reams through do uh, all sorts of documents and things all the time to synthesize things that are happening in the world around him. He invented the browser to make the internet easier for him to find information. That was the essence of what it was. Did he think there'd be a possibility to make billions? Maybe, I don't know. I've never asked him. But in the essence, there was something he needed, he wanted, that he thought would be of value, and that's what drove him. Anybody who has listened to today or yesterday or any other time Dr. Knife knows that he's sitting on what is probably going to be one heck of a business. But that's not the reason he went into this. He loves this. As a friend of mine in the journalism world says, he wants it in his teeth. He wants it so badly it's in his teeth. And he may fail, but it doesn't matter because it's what you want. In my introduction, it was described that I'm running now one of the largest collections of online health sites or disease-specific websites, and they've got some technical information with them and some science that's involved with them overall. But the essence of the sites is it's a collection of people who have been there sharing their experiences, right? All of you have had someone in your family, maybe you yourselves have gone through something. At the end of the day, if you're diagnosed with cancer, it is stunning, it is shocking, it is fearful. You want to know everything there is to know about the science, but you also have to know how to tell your children or tell your friends. If you have a parent with Alzheimer's, you know how terrible that can be, but at the end of the day, only people who've been there can tell you how you should be handling the circumstance that you have overall, and that's what we do. We're a collection of experiences of people who've been there. It doesn't take away from the doctor, but it has everything to do with people connecting on their terms. Why? 
10 years ago, 12 years ago, within a year, I had two really remarkable experiences upon reflection of them. And in some respects, neither of them had anything to do with me, and they had everything to do with me at the same time. But my wife's gorgeous and wonderful mother was diagnosed with adenocarcinoma of the lungs with metastases to the head. And anyone who follows medicine at all knows that's it. You're not going to make that one. And it's just a matter of time. But it's a shocking diagnosis. And about two years later, my very best friend, or one of my very best friends at the time, who had been fighting an incredibly gallant fight against bipolar disorder, lost his battle. He took his own life. And one of the things that I found at that time, which was amazing, and it was really the early precursors of what's happening in all technology today, is I was able to find a listserv in those days. It wasn't even a website, right? It was a listserv. Anybody remember those? On adenocarcinoma. And not only did I find one on adenocarcinoma, I found one on adenocarcinoma with metastases of the brain. And not only did I find one on adenocarcinomas with metastases of the brain, I found one that talked about pain in the ass husbands who mean well and are trying to help their wives whose parents are going through this but are probably doing it all wrong. And what did I find out? I was pretty much doing it all wrong. When I went through the item, I'm a grandson of uh, Italian immigrants, and right, you, you don't have depression if you're a grandson of Italian immigrants. It's, you suck it up and you get back to work, and there's no possibility this thing could be an illness or whatever else. But in point of fact, it is, and it's very profound and very structural. So began my education in this, counter to anything I've been raised to. It was finding listservs and then websites of guys in their 20s at the time and 30s who were trying to figure out how to be friends to someone who'd been that that tells you that sense of nuance. I knew from those two experiences, even when I got into the online news business, that one day I'd be figuring out how these technologies and tools were going to have this kind of impact in a larger, more scalable, more interactive way. I can tell you it's a hell of a business, great, but that's not why I did it either. It is something that I wanted in my teeth, and I can tell you I've had so many near-death experiences in this company, so many days that I was convinced that we're on to the greatest new thing on earth, and 24 hours later convinced I'd have to go back to the ground and start figuring out how I was going to make a living again. I can't tell you, but that's the way it is, and it's fine. Because of my last observation, which is it's a cliche to say that it's lonely at the top and it's lonely to be an entrepreneur because it's true. It absolutely is. But you can kill loneliness. One of the themes I think you've heard a lot of people talk about today, which I'm going to add in addition to, is find mentors, which is awesome. People have been there, gray hairs like me, who have been through this before and have seen a lot of stuff. They can help you make you feel right. They can help you take the squirrels rattling around in your head and pull them out and have the things that make order and make sense to you overall. But I actually think one of the ways to kill loneliness are the people in this room. People like you who are going through what you're going through, because I don't remember what it's like to be 27 anymore, but there are a bunch of other people here who are starting up companies who are 27. One, it's amazing what you learn from each other, even if your businesses are relevant, but just because you're thinking about a HR consideration or a financing consideration or how to live your life consideration, but it kills loneliness. It gives you the opportunity to think outside of yourself, which it allows you to ease the fear of failure and to stay focused on that which is in your teeth, that which is what you love most. I love that Alfie, in an earlier presentation, told us that he was a science fiction fan. I'm not, actually. But I have to tell you, one of my favorite quotes as I think about the internet, investment, running companies overall, came from a brilliant, brilliant science fiction writer, Arthur C. Clarke. And he said, most revolutions are overestimated in the short run and underestimated in the long run. Overestimated in the short run, and underestimated in the long run. And I think that is a great overview of much of what we've experienced, certainly in the United States, but globally in the Internet overall, because the revolution that is in our midst is profound. Something is happening here, here, in Dubai, and around the world, that is something that is totally historic, and it really starts with individuals. It starts with guys like you in this room who are saying, why not me? Why not me? I may fail but then I'll dust myself off and there'll be the next thing. Why? If for no other reason, because there are a lot of people not as good as you who've made it. That's one thing you can be encouraging. I think there are two kinds of arrogance. You can think you're better than anyone else and that tends to run into problems. You can think at least that you're no worse. That's not a bad place to be, I think, when you step up in the level of courage. I would suggest to you the long run is now. And you folks are here at a historic moment and it's an honor to be a part of it. So thank you for listening to me. If there are any questions, I'd be happy to take them, or we can go listen to more music.
please. My, my favorite line of this whole conference, I think, was Aris' response to that comment, because he, in fact, were with the same investor who made this comment about the energy here, which is like Silicon Valley in the late 90s or even over the last blow-off. One, I have to say it's absolutely true. I, I can't get over the energy here. I can't get over the sense of wonderment. I can't get over the sense of potential. I can't get over that. And there is an analogy there. Now, remember, that leads to bubbles and blow-ups and a bunch of other things. But my favorite line, maybe, of this conference was Arif, who said, what's Silicon Valley? It's not the point that we're, you know, it's amazing to me. We are such anecdotal animals. We have to drive through side view mirrors. We need to be something that's been there before as opposed to something that's new. And yeah, there are analogies, and it does help us to explain things overall. But what happens here, what you guys are doing here, is new. It is unique. You have unique problems, but you have unique opportunities which are stunning, absolutely stunning. So, great. It feels like Silicon Valley. I, from now on, I'm going around. The next couple of years, I'm saying anything that's exciting feels like Dubai. That's what I'm going to say. Short, quick, and internet. Uh, good afternoon. I've got a question uh, about, of course, failure. Uh, I think that it's not only the, to fear failure, but it's as well the consequences of the failure it can be financials. And uh, mentally speaking, I think that what do you think about uh, having a failure and be obliged to become an employee again? Do you think that it can be kind of a hurdle? Uh, because at the end of the day, it can be like a real failure for everybody here. Who have, start, who have started their venture, and they just become an employee again. And uh, so what do you think about it? You know, I think in a way that you're asking two things, one of which I wanted to allude to, maybe cavalierly and slightly poking front of my French friend, that it is painful. Scar tissue is painful. You've gone through a surgery or you hurt something or you had a knife stuck into you or whatever. To, again, to make it, it, sometimes when I hear people talk about failure and its acceptance in the States, I don't think that they really stop and think about that ramification, which is it's got financial ramifications for you, it's got financial ramifications for your family, there are other people around you who may have invested with you. All these things are real. And I think at the end of the day, though, they still manifest themselves mostly in your self-perception. It is in large part the arbiter of what you may think to do next. Now, out of necessity, you may say to yourself, I have to take a job, or I have to do something to pay the bills and everything else. That's fine. I think the only counsel that I would give under the cavalier aegis that it's easy for me to say this is find a job that you love and find a job that's still building the things that you love so that one day you can have it in your teeth again. There's nothing wrong with that. But I have to tell you, I have found very few people who really have entrepreneurship in their teeth who last very long in a job once they've bit into it. And, but there's a trade-off of reality, and when that's fine, that's fine. It doesn't mean it's buried forever, but it may be buried temporarily, and it may open up other doors, other relationships, other potentialities, which are wonderful. Please. Thank you. Chris, I've got this pet theory that all the kind of success literature of the past 15 years telling us you can do it and you can be a millionaire has actually encouraged a lot of people to become entrepreneurs who probably aren't cut out for it, because many people aren't made out for being entrepreneurs. They're made out for being very, very good employees in large organizations. But all this success literature and entrepreneurs you can do it stuff almost belittles people working in multinational companies and having a day job. This is a pet theory of, of mine, but am I way off the mark? No, I don't is think so. I, I, I think, always a good thing? I, I, look, I, I mean, it, we could have a whole longer panel about the media and how people have been sort of pushed into boxes of ways to think about themselves, which goes back to my idea about thinking about how other people think about you as opposed to the essence of who you are and what it is that you want to do. And it's a wonderful conversation, and much of which I think I'd agree with implicit in your comment here. I have to tell you that if I've learned anything in life, and this is a father, it is a CEO, it is as an investor, it is a friend, is that there's nothing more important, I think, at the end for us as individuals, I mean, our integrity and all is probably paramount, but is fit fit. 
Don't try to be, in the, in the same way that I said before, you don't want to be what other people think you ought to be, meaning keeping you from doing things. You shouldn't try to become something because other people think it's a good thing. It has to be about fit and what it is that you want to do. I mean, a good test is if you thought of yourself 20 years from now, would I look back and say, man, I never did it. I never tried it, right? Because you could try it and fail it, but at least you could say that you tried it overall. But it really, it is in your teeth. It's not that much of a debatable point. Does it in any way denigrate people who are doing God's work in large companies and all? I think that's in the eye of the beholder. I never denigrate it at all. I'm blown away by what people are doing and the types of impact that they have. I was very pleased and fortunate with some of the friends in the room here to get a briefing from the CEO of Lockheed Martin, for God's sake. I mean, it's about as unentrepreneurial as you can get, and the guy was a genius. Fascinating, strategic, had a view of the world, which was profound. I don't think it's a judgment call in that way. It's really about fit, and if it fits, it's something you should try. When I was in graduate school, they surveyed the first year students in graduate school, and they said, how many people plan to run their own companies at some point in their lives, be entrepreneurs? And that's, I forget what the numbers are, but bear with me. Directionally, 67 or 70 percent of them said they will be entrepreneurs and have to run their own companies. And 70 percent of my graduating class went to McKinsey or Wall Street. Now, having said that, a lot of them are entrepreneurs now. Who might have critiqued their path? They did what they did. I only hope they loved what they loved. Sorry. Hi. We live in a culture in the, in the UAE, but I would uh, address it to the whole region. But failure is a bit harder to shake off. Um, it's a very reputation-based society. Um, and mistakes our grandfathers have done could linger with the grandchildren. Um, what is your advice for cu cultural changes? We, we have an opportunity. The majority of the region is under the age of 25. Yeah. Um, what is the, the advice that you can give the youth here that, about failure and how to change the cultural norms that we are living by? I, I, would, I would never bang bear or think that I've got the expertise to get into the nuances and the power of culture. And I think it's very real and very profound. The only thing that I would counsel you is that past is not prologue. That which we were raised with, I mean, look, if we've learned anything in the last 15 or 20 years of humanity, that which we were raised as young children to deal with going forward, almost all of it's on its ear. And it is one step of a time. I would tell you that things like Maktoub has changed the perception and dynamic. The fact that there is an entire generation of incredibly innovative, highly educated 20-somethings, they're going to care a little bit less. I'm not saying that it's meaningless or nothing. All I can tell you is you start somewhere. And I think that something is starting here. I mean, could you, you tell me this. I mean, I defer to you. Could you imagine this gathering eight years ago? Could you imagine this gathering two years ago? Could you imagine Maktoub five years ago? Could you imagine Dr. Knife a year ago? So it happens. It's not going to be easy, but it's there. I think I have time for one more. Yes, my name is Ahmed Lamtawa. I'm a cousin of Dr. Knife. <laughs> Thank you very much. Actually, I have my own firm. Uh, it's called Al Mutawa Consulting Group. It's located in Kuwait. I'm a graduate of uh, USC. It's Rojan and Spirit and Family. Whoever is here, is, uh, raise your hand. Right on, fight on. Okay, uh, my question to you is, what's your intake on awakening the entrepreneur inside of the employer or the person who is actually an intrapreneur? Yes. Not, and what about the reawakening moments that happens after the failures? Two observations, and I think people could disagree with this. I, I think there is a difference between an entrepreneur and an entrepreneur. In fact, I have to tell you, among the myriad of failings that I've had, is betting on entrepreneurs to be great entrepreneurs in my setting. What I mean by that is if you're an entrepreneur, as he's suggesting, you're within a larger organization, but you're shaking things up. You're hoping, getting them to do things differently. Sometimes you're carved. I was an entrepreneur. I ran WashingtonPostNewsweek.com, and so I was off in this little company in Virginia that was separate, and I spent 30% of my time trying to keep the newspaper and the magazines and the TV stations from trying to make me go away. That is a different kind of experience in entrepreneurship where you're thinking passionately about your product and what it is you're trying to do with different risks. But it's a different risk profile, it's a different set of skills. But it's also incredibly powerful. And in the right organization with the right people, you can have tremendous, tremendous success 
as an entrepreneur and change companies. Companies do change. They do evolve, maybe more slowly, more differently. But I think in the end, it is a question of who you are and what your fit is. I have known entrepreneurs who become good entrepreneurs. I was an entrepreneur. I'm doing okay as an entrepreneur. But it's rarer. So if you say to yourself, I'd like to be an entrepreneur within a company, I can learn a lot of skills, but it's a temporary step to the way for me to have that thing in my teeth, that's a wonderful path. If you say to yourself, I want to do this in large organizations, that's fine. It all matters to what fits, to what you want to do. But the one other thing that I would say, as cliched as this may sound, but I think it's fundamentally true, I think in life, I don't care if it's your angel investor or somebody within an organization that you just described, who you work with or for is as important as the gig and anything else. If you are a great entrepreneur in an organization or surrounded by people who simply don't value it, time to find another place to do it regardless. What? So you're an entrepreneur. It's nice to see you guys. Thank you for your time.